Ephesians chapter number 4. The Apostle Paul is drawing this chapter on and as he moves in he gets into the talking about being a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. He talks about the ones. There's one baptism, one this, one body, one spirit, and one Lord, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. And then verse 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of God. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, According to the effectual, effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body under the edifying of itself in love. I want to preach on this thought. Why are you here? Why are you here? Now, with a partial shutdown going on and knowing that there's folks walking, uh, being at home, we're going to pretend like you're here. Even if you're watching from the house. But I want to ask the question, why are you here? Father, we love you and we thank you for your word. I pray you just help us to read it, believe it, and apply it. It's truth whether we believe it and apply it or not. So we might as well believe it and apply it. Lord, we ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You can be seated. Pastor, now over 17 years, it's, it's, it's strange. It's, it's very weird. It's a weird process. A lot more thinking going on. Man, I, I did over a decade at a, at a nuclear pharmacy, and I do more thinking here than I ever did there. I got to where I could do decay charts in my brain. I could memorize the important parts of package inserts off of drugs and not have to think about it anymore. Some high-paid pharmacist that ask a question like, when does Octreo scan calibrated? I'm like, it is calibrated at 6 o'clock in the morning on Saturday and Thursday, Central Standard Time. Two hours later, when does Octreo scan calibrate? I'm like, it's still calibrated at 6 in the morning. I'd get frustrated because people wouldn't think. They wouldn't remember things. You need to know how long the half-life of technesium 99M is. You need to know the, the decay on, on uh, thallium 201. You need to know gallium 67, xenon 133, I 131, I 123. You, we needed to know that information. Because we were sending medicine out to people. We were receiving bloody nuclear waste back. And we had to store that waste the right amount of time. I could get rid of a lot of technesium 99M because it had a very short half-life. Get rid of it in three days. Anything over about 60 hours, I'd give it 72. That was my job. But I don't need somebody accidentally putting I-131 in there because it has a really long half-life. It's going to sit for months. And you just want people to think. But even that job... Trying to figure out how much medicine to take out of this and to put that into a syringe, you know, and like drawing that up into a syringe and trying to get the right amount of medicine so it would be 20 millicuries at 9.30 in the morning tomorrow for this particular patient. 
And you get that one done. Then now you got to know how much to make it at 11:30. 30 millicuries, you know, and you you just learn how to do it, and you don't have to think all the time. I guarantee you, for 17 years, I ain't done nothing but think. My brain is tired. It's hard figuring out people. And so many times over the years, I've thought to myself, why is this person here? Are they looking for a place to serve? Are they running from something? Are they embarrassed and their old church found out about it? Do, Do they need to be saved? Are they looking for a hiding place? Do, do they love God? Why are they here? Sometimes you, you can answer that question in a week. Sometimes it's years and years and you're still like, why are they here? What? Why are you here? I'll be honest. I've asked myself, why, why am I here? Why am I here? They could cut me loose and get a good preacher. They could cut me loose and get a lot better pastor. There's a difference between being a pastor and being a preacher. Preaching's the fun part most of the time. Pastoring's the hard. When you're pastoring a whole lot, that's when you're like, why am I here? You're, 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 you're right in the middle of a counseling session and you're daydreaming about the hills of Ireland because you want to be anywhere but right here, right now. I mean, we've had weird things happen. I've had people die in my arms. I, I've held people's hands when they passed away. I can't tell you how many times I've been holding a person's hand and holding their child's hand. Little kids, grown kids, Spouses, brothers and sisters, hold people's hands. There's been times when I've been in the hospital with my own family members, holding their hand going, you know, if, if, if pastor would come by, this would be a lot. Of, oh, yeah, that's me. When you're not the pastor, you can call the pastor. When you are the pastor, it's like, it's Jesus and me. You know, it's just us. I don't have a pastor to call. I have some pastor friends that I call on every once in a while. I'm like, hey, brother, you ever run across this? They're like, no. I'm like, you ain't no help. I was talking to an older preacher about a situation. I said, brother, you got to know what's happening. I said, what, 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 do, what do we do? And he said, I don't know what to do. I said, you better know what to do. You've been doing this for 200 years. At the time, I was like, I've been doing this eight years, brother. I don't know what to do. I feel like a little kid. When you go read, when when you're getting like, when God's talking to Solomon, he's asking Solomon, Solomon, what what do you want? And Solomon's like, hmm. Do I want the head of my enemies? I mean, who doesn't want the head of their enemies? Do, do I want to be rich? Do I just want to be powerful? Do I want to be popular? He gives the most humbling thing, and he just says, I'm like a child. And I've got this big job you've laid out in front of me with so, this so great of people. Lord, can you give me some wisdom? God was so pleased. He was so pleased that he said, oh, I like it so much. I'm going to give you the head of your enemies. I'm going to give you, you know, he gives him everything he wants, including wisdom. Why are you here? Are you a captive? A lot of young people are captives. My kids are captives. We've been raising them on drugs. We drug them on every Sunday morning, every Sunday afternoon. We drug them back on Wednesdays. We drug them on other days. We drug them to preachers meeting across, whether it's around the world or or across the nation. We've drug them all over the place. They're captives. We drug them, and they're captives. They they go. And uh, my prayer is that our boys, when they're 
20, 22, 32, 42, they'll still be here. But why are you here? You ever thought about that? I mean, do you just feel guilty? I mean, guilt works. Guilt works. Heavy-handed preachers know how to make you feel guilty so you'll do what they want you to do. I know a bunch of those guys. I don't want to be one of those guys. You, know, you don't want a lot of people in church? Not against their will. It's a waste of time. I, I don't want people to come here out of guilt. I don't want people to come here and not want to be here. I want people to want to be here, but why are you here? Some people are here because of another family member. And they feel obligated. Some people are here because if they weren't here, their, their, their mama would kick them out. They've already been told, that if you don't go to church, you're out of here, buddy. And that's why they're here. There are some people, we've had couples come to church and you find out as soon as she dies, he gone. I know why he was here. Or the reverse, and we know why she was here. But why are you here? You're supposed to have a purpose. We don't just show up. I mean, you ain't coming for the entertainment, are you? I mean, there's more, more talented music, and I appreciate our musicians, but there's more talented mu mu musicians elsewhere. There's more talented singers elsewhere. There's better preachers elsewhere. Instead of me stomping on your toes, you can go listen to Happy Smiling Joel. He can, he can give you a shot in the arm every week. It ain't going to be out of the Word of God, but you know. There's a purpose for us being here. A lot of people never think about it. We just go to church because that's what we do. We come out of habit. I'm here because this is my church. What do you do at your church? I stand up when they say stand up. I turn to the songs. I sing. I sit down when we're supposed to sit down. I dig in my pocket and put some money in the offering plate. That's what I do. There's supposed to be more than that. So why are you here? Look at verse 7 again. He says, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. When you trust on Christ, when you get Christ, God, you get the gift of salvation. You get the gift of eternal life. But you get more than that. God can take what you know how to do. You're like, what do you know how to do? I don't know. I'm scared to death to talk in front of people. Isn't that ironic? That's ironic to me. But I am. I'm terribly afraid to speak in front of people. I'm naturally kind of shy. Now, if you know me and you're around me a lot, I, I just have to do what I have to do. But really... I'd like to go home and lay down in bed. I'm comfortable there. We have a great bed. We remodeled our bedroom and we messed up. It's the best room in the whole house. It's a sanctuary. It's a peaceful place. That's where I want to be. If I'm just being honest, if I was going to be in our city right now, if I was going to be anywhere, I want to be at my address in bed. At least in the bedroom. We put a love seat in there. It has a sitting area in it because it's just a wonderful place to be. That's where I would rather be. But I'm here because I have a purpose. I hope you're here knowing that you have a purpose. Verse 7 says, But unto every one of us, and he's writing to the believers in Ephesus, he's writing to a New Testament, local New Testament church. And he says he's given grace according to the measure of the gift of God. And then he talks about when he ascended up on high and low and all that. Now look, verse 11. He gave some apostles. He did. Paul was one of them. Now, when you get some guy in Africa who sends you a friend request, and you, and you have like two random weird, one of them's a preacher that you know from somewhere, and he wants to be your friend, and he's apostle so-and-so. No, he's a heretic so-and-so. We're told in the Bible, the Apostle Paul recognized that they were apostles last. 
The apostles were people that directly saw Jesus Christ and learned from him. They were disciples turned apostles. So if you haven't seen Jesus Christ in the flesh and have not learned from him, you're definitely not an apostle. That was a specific thing for this time. God used them. They did great exploits. They had amazing things that they did. God used them. They did miracles. There were people who just wanted to get inside Peter's shadow to be healed. That's some juice. They could lay hands on and be healed. Now, because people don't know how to rightly divide in their Bible, they just carry on all things for all times. And that's why you have a bunch of pretenders who, who say they're faith healers who want to get up on television and coronavirus. <laughs> Not only are you, do you need to stop doing that, if you're going to do that, you need a Tic Tac, sir. But it's heresy. Now, could God use us to do miracles? Sure. Have we been present to see some pretty amazing things happen? Oh, yeah. I love it that in, just in my life, my life, just my life, there are times when I have to say, and before I tell you this story, before you think I'm crazy, just know I can give you multiple phone numbers of people to call who were witness. Waking a man up hours before they took him off a ventilator after he'd been in a coma, completely unresponsive for 21 days. Yelled at him and woke him up. How's that? You just think my singing voice is bad. My speaking voice ain't much better. I can wake the dead. And I got phone numbers of people you can call as witnesses. We have prayed over bottles of medicine that it doesn't even make sense that it should work. And people don't have cancer anymore. So how do you explain that? I don't know. I don't know. But we, enough people know the truth about that that we get phone calls about people with cancer all the time. Most of the time it's too late. Most of the time they're already on their deathbed. One of the most amazing was a man who had been given less than 30 days to live. He died. 11 years later. We just, we, we know, we, we've seen. We've seen God use strange things to do miracles. It is unbelievable. And I don't care. Somebody says, well, well can you do that? I, no, I, I, I didn't produce it the first time. I certainly can't reproduce it. But God can do anything. I don't know how God does stuff. I'm just glad that God does stuff. Amen. And the longer I serve him, the more stuff we get to see God do. But I'm not here to see the miracles. I, I enjoy the miracles. I love seeing the miracles. I love seeing lives change, but that, that's not why I'm here. I'm here because God called me to be here. I just know. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists. I hope to be an evangelist one of these days. Praise the Lord. And some pastors, that's where I'm at. And teachers, that's where I'm at. God gives gifts to people. As far as I can tell, the only one that's not current on this list is the apostle. We know evangelists. I want to be one. Prophets, there's no new prophecy. So apostles and prophets. You go, wait a minute. Don't you want God to give you some revelation? No. I need God to give me illumination. Amen. The Bible calls these some dark sayings in here. I just need God to turn the lights on. Amen. Every once in a while I'll be reading through and be like, I never saw that before. And I know that's not true because I've read it cover to cover so many times that I know I've seen it, but I didn't see it. And God will give me something and it just it turns illumination. So there's not apostles, there's not prophets today, but there are pastors, there are teachers, there are evangelists. And there's a purpose for you placing yourself under the leadership of teachers, pastors, and evangelists. There's a purpose. It's found in the next verse. 
It says, for the perfecting of the saints. That, that's to make us complete and, and, and full force for his use. We're supposed to place ourselves under teachers and pastors and evangelists for the work of the ministry. This is not my church. When I go to places, I hear God, my church does this. I just always kind of cringe a little bit. There's a few where I try not to use the word proud or pride about things. I, I'm, I try not to be proud of anything because it's never good in the Bible. And then, but I also, I never try to refer to Lighthouse Baptist Church as my church. Even though we started the church. I was explaining to the children last night, we were going through Proverbs and about people who mess up and all that. I said, if our church family decides they hate my guts tomorrow, they could vote me out. And it's the church that I started. Another church sent us here to start this church. But I'm not the final authority. Nor are you as the congregation. We together have the authority to call another pastor. Or just to dump this one. But the word of God, our heavenly father, that, the Bible is our final authority. Amen. The Bible has to be our final authority. I think is not the final authority. I believe is not the final authority. The word of God, the Bible, is our final authority on all matters. If the Bible says thou shalt not, we shouldn't. If the Bible says we should, we should. Now you've got to rightly divide it because we're not Jewish. And we're not Gentiles. We are the church. Jews are not Gentiles, are not the church. Comprende? Yes? Yes. You, have, you just have to understand that. You've got to figure out where you fit. So if Jesus is saying something in his earthly ministry, and he's telling Jewish people what to do, that may not apply to us at all in the church age. And if Jesus is talking to us in the church age, through, through the Apostle Paul, most likely, then... That's probably not going to apply to Jews during the tribulation. Everything, and there are some people though that try to do replacement theology, and and we just you know because we teach our kids Father Abraham, I mean, and all of a sudden we all become spiritual Jews, and which is true in a sense, but we have to understand that not everything applies to us in every age. There are differences. And those differences are very important. Because time, sometimes Jesus is talking to people where they're at right now. He's talking to people about things that are going to happen later. And you have to understand, when you get to the book of Revelation, it says, write these things unto the churches. To this church, and to this church, and to this church, and to this church. For three chapters. And then all of a sudden, you see, come up hither. Rapture. Just think rapture. And after that, it becomes tribe, tribe, tribe. What tribe are you from? You don't know because you ain't well, I'm of one. You're of the church. Amen. You're not of the tribe. The Jews are of the tribe. Does that make sense? So why are you here? Well, we've got work to do. That's why. For the work of the ministry. The reason that we place ourselves under teachers is so that we know the whole counsel of God. We know where we fit in in the program. And we do work. The work of the ministry. And I thank God that our church family has so many people in it that have literally come alongside us to help us do more work in the ministry. It's so weird how people are like, We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work. Till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. Meanwhile, they're sitting down, ain't doing nothing until the rapture happens. Then all of a sudden they pick up the old Baptist anthem. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. All of a sudden, we're not talking about getting moved off doctrine. We ain't going to be moved off our chair. We're not going to be moved off our rumps because we're lazy. God didn't, hey, God didn't save you to sit. God didn't save me to sit. God didn't save me to be lazy. We're saved to serve. The Bible says we are saved unto good works. Hey, not by good works. 
He says, not of works, lest any man should boast. But we're saved unto good works. We're saved for works, not by works. Well, look at verse 12. For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. It's our job to make one another stronger, better, more joyful. We're supposed to edify one another. Not tear down one another. Um, did you see what she was wearing? There he is again. I'll never forgive him for what he said. What? Are you kidding me? What if God treated you that way? What if God treated us the way we treat others? Would God be up in heaven going, Psst, angels, come here. Come here, come here, come here. Look at this nonsense. They think they're going to get away with that? They never even bother getting right. Watch this. I'm going to, no, God doesn't torture us and talk bad about, are you kidding me? Our job, friend, is to be per perfected, to be complete so we can serve God. Somebody sent me a thing, a stupid game on my phone as I was playing this game. And there's people in there and they have to do some training. It's like they can be real strong in one area, but they need training in every area to be complete. They're never what they're supposed to And I'm like, that's like the ministry right there. Some people are real strong in one. You'll have people, listen, we have had young people that could memorize entire chapters of the scripture. And they had a couple of very serious, honest engine, really bad tragedies happen in their family and to them personally. And they're out. They were really strong in one area. They were weak in some other areas. I know a young man who has preaching trophies. He won preacher, preacher boy of the year, preaching trophies, preaching trophies, trophies that were as tall as he was. He ain't even in church today. He was strong in some areas, but he was weak in others. Listen, the reason God gives us teachers and pastors and evangelists, and you say, well, I want prophets and, and apostles. Okay, good, they're right here. They're right here. Isaiah, Isaiah Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum. How about all those? You like those? Those are good ones, huh? Get you to Habakkuk. You want some apostles? Got them. Just read all you like. But in person, God gives us teachers and preachers and pastors. And the purpose is not to be entertained. Aren't you glad? We'd all be failures. The purpose is so that we can grow in Christ to be complete and well-rounded Christians. I don't mean like from the buffet and eating too much at lunch. Not that kind of well-rounded. I'm, I'm talking about to be perfected for the use of the ministry. So we can do the work of the ministry. So we can edify one another. You say, well, how long is that going to take? I don't know. Maybe verse 13 will help us. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. How about until we all believe right? How about that? And of the knowledge of the Son of God. You need to know Jesus. I need to know Jesus. We need to know Him personally. We need to know Him so personally. It's not enough to have a long distance pen pal relationship. Man, we need to pray to God every day. We need to walk with the Lord. Man, my brain is just, music is flowing. The longer I serve Him, the sweeter He grows.
unto a perfect man. That, that doesn't mean like what my wife thinks I am. That means like complete, complete perfect. Not lacking anything. Under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That means you, until we all become complete and all together what Jesus Christ wants us to be. That's why we're here. You're like, oh, well, I was just here to see brother so-and-so. I was just here because that one girl was real pretty. I was just here because that one boy is just so dreamy. That's not why we're supposed to be here. I think sometimes we forget and we get confused about why we're here. Look at verse 14. That we henceforth, that means from now on, be no more children. You're here so you can grow up in the Lord. Stop being a baby. Stop being a child. Grow up. Grow up. Tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Preacher, you know what I heard? What about this? What about that? I heard a really old preacher, like 250-year-old preacher. He said, if it's new, it ain't true. And if it's true, it certainly ain't new. All we have is this body of truth. This is our final authority. We don't need something else. I always get nervous. I've been doing a word study on this. I go, really, what verses? Now I was reading this book by, why don't you read the book written by the Holy Spirit? Amen. How'd that, that'd probably help you. Well, I need to know what this word really meant. Well, why don't you compare scripture with scripture? Or get a good dictionary. If you can't sort it out, usually you can get it scripture to scripture. But by chance, if there's a word and you're like, ah, I still don't know. Get a reliable dictionary. Be nice to have one with, uh, with, with scripture references in it. You like a dictionary with scripture references? A lot of times I'll use the, the Webster's 1828. Now, it's not scripture. It's not the final authority. This is the final authority. But it's pretty reliable most of the time. But we need to make sure that we're, we're, not, we're grown up and we're not just getting these wild hair ideas. So many kids, children are so easily influenced. So easily influenced. One of the heartbreaks of the ministry is watching really good kids who get around one bad kid, one bad cousin, one bad neighbor, one bad kid in the youth group. And it throws their whole life into a tailspin. Because we're so, so vulnerable to influence. I was explaining to my family last night why I have stepped back from so many preachers. We came across that in Proverbs where it says that we just, we're not going to meddle with them that are given to change. When people change, I'm like, mm, no, nah, I don't want to change. Yeah, but shouldn't you get up and debate and debate and debate and debate? No, because I'm not going to be debating them. I'm going to be debating them and whatever influence that has mess with them and, and, and they're going to try to gang up and listen I don't want to mess with that stuff I'm not looking to change they know what's right they can go prodigal if they want to I ain't fitting to chase them down by the way the father was watching for them and he was excited when they came back he didn't chase them down he didn't go out and put an APB he wasn't milking the cows and on every can of milk that he passed out uh, he didn't have this kid's picture on it going have you seen me he wasn't doing that. When people were taking their ox carts down the road to go sell their wheat and go sell their barley, uh, his kid's name wasn't up on some big billboard flashing at them as they, as they went by. But he was watching for them. And I'll praise God if some of my old friends come back, but I ain't fitting to chase them down a road. The Bible says don't meddle with them. They're given to change. I've just had to let some go. But if you're a child, it says, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, 
whereby they lie in wait to deceive. If I found out somebody's a Calvinist, I'm like, mm, no, I don't want to talk about it. Well, what about the tulip? And isn't it tulips, sunflowers, roses? You know what? I'm not really down in a whole lot of horticulture, okay? You, you keep that. I'm just going to stick with the Bible. I'm going to stick with what thus saith the Lord. I don't need to know what John Calvin had to say. If somebody wants to uh, believe in replacement theology, you know, I'm just like, mm, no, I'm going to just come over here. In this day and age in which we live here in the church age, 100%, everybody, man, woman, child, Jew, Gentile, it doesn't matter who you are, Chinaman, Mexican, white, black, red, indifferent. Listen, you can mix it all. You can be great. You, you're going to trust in Jesus Christ or you're going to go to hell. How about that? If you don't put your faith in Jesus Christ, you'll go straight to hell. I don't, no free passes. You can have the star of Moloch on it or whatever you want to have. Uh, it, you know, weird looking, almost pentagram looking thing. I ain't, no. I ain't having it. I guess the star of David. David didn't have a star. How about that? Better look up the origin of that thing. I'm not down with the Hebrew roots movement. I'll just take a giant step back from that. I ain't supporting that stuff. I'm in Jesus roots theology. They wait to deceive. But instead, look at verse 15. We're supposed to grow up and do this. Speaking the truth in love. We can grow up into Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Stop looking to veggie tales for your theology. Stop looking to the picture pages in your, in, in, in your big family tabletop Bible to try to figure out what Jesus looked like. He didn't look like that. He, can I tell you, physically... There's a good chance Jesus was ugly. He said, you better be careful. Or I could just believe the Bible. He had no form nor comeliness. And when we look at him, there's nothing to be desired. How about that? Boy, it gets quiet in here. Y'all get nervous. Y'all nervous? You okay? I, I, I'll just get some scripture to you. It says we need to grow up into Christ. He's the head of all things. It's not your favorite preacher. It's not Dr. So-and-so. I don't care how, how big of a TV show he has. I don't give a rip about his TV ratings. Do you understand me? I don't care how many private jets he has. I don't care. I have two pickup trucks. That's more than I deserve. Way more than I deserve. Jesus Christ is the head. And it says in verse 16, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted. Guys, we're supposed to be together on things. If we're the body, not everybody's the arm. Not everybody's an eyeball. If we was the eyeball, where's the hearing? If we were all ears, where's the seeing? If we were all mouths, where's the walking? If we were all feet, where's the taste? We're all different. And God uses our differences. And he equips us together. I was talking with one of our dear widow women right after church. Her husband died nine years ago yesterday. Nine years ago yesterday, we lost one of the most hardworking men in our church. Just a hardworking dude. He painted the entire building single-handedly. He built things. We could turn this platform into a raging ocean with battling ships. We've turned this front of this sanctuary into a western town with secret hideouts and, and a lot of that framing and stuff all happened 
from an old man with some mad skills. And then we used artists and others came together and creativity. And not everybody could build. Not everybody could draw and paint. Not everybody could act. Not everybody was willing to be silly. Not everybody could give money. Not everybody could do this. But together, guys, we have pulled off some stuff in vacation Bible schools that I can't even imagine. This morning, right after the morning service, I stood on the front porch and cried. Thinking about That man and another man, those two guys, we lost them real close together. And I almost quit. I almost quit. And I don't quit anything. I'm not a quitter. And I almost quit. I lost my confidence. I felt like I lost my way. And I just had to come to myself. I just had to come to myself and be like, why are you here? I wasn't here because of those old guys. I love them. I miss them terribly. I was closer to them than I am many of my own family. But I had to ask myself, why am I here? I'm not here because those guys knew all the answers. I'm not, I wasn't here because those guys could help me do anything. If I dreamt it and drew it, they could make it happen. But that's not why I was here. I was here then for the same reason I'm here now, because I know this is where God wants me to be. This is where God wants me to serve. He gave some pastors, so you're stuck with me. Why are you here? I hope, like me, you're here to learn, you're here to do, you're here to serve. You're here to grow and become more in Christ. If that's not why you're here, you're here for the wrong reason. Now, I'm glad you're here. Over the years, we've seen some come, we've seen some go. And we realized that some had come for the wrong reason. They went out from us because they were never of us. They never became fitly together as part of the body. Now some that go, hallelujah, the young family. We're excited about them going. I'm going to miss them like crazy. In fact, I'm probably just going to get on an airplane and go see them every once in a while. But they came here. We fell in love with their family. Their family loves us. But they have a purpose. They came here to get the very last little bit of what they needed so that they can go where they're supposed to go. And they have to ask themselves, why are we here in Honduras? And it's to replicate where they came from. We all came out of the same church. And we came here. And then from here, they're going there. And then when they're there, they're going to start churches and replicate and replicate and replicate. The same things that you and I are doing right now in Ephesians chapter number 4. We're growing in Christ and helping others grow in Christ so that we can duplicate ourselves and replicate ourselves. Does that make sense? Why are you here? What, What role do you have? What role do you think God wants you to have? We ought to ask ourselves that every once in a while. Not like, why am I here? I'm out of here. I want to leave. No. But figure out why you're here and what does God want me to do? Some people have beautiful voices. God wants you to sing. Some people know doctrine and have confidence. And God wants you to teach. Some of you have had a surrender on your life. God wants you to prepare and go. Why are you here? Why are you here? Let's all stand. Learning is a good reason to be here. Getting equipped to serve is a good reason to be here. Serving is a good reason to be here. Witnessing 
Giving to missions. Surrendering to missions. All good reasons to be here. Edifying. Growing. All valid reasons to be here. Where are you at? And where are you headed? Father in heaven, we love you. Lord, I pray that you have spoken to hearts. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to determine why we're here, what you'd have us to do. Lord, we just want to be found faithful. Would you bless the invitation time, please? In Jesus' name.